fundamental question is not that you, or the, what we're looking for is not that you have osteoporosis. What we're looking for is why you have osteoporosis. Knowing that you have osteoporosis doesn't really help us because it doesn't give us a set of action, a course of proper correction. It doesn't tell us why. Again, this is the one question we want to answer. So what are the reasons that a person might develop bone loss? As we mentioned earlier, understanding the principle of Wolf's Law, which is use it or lose it, meaning one of the biggest reasons why people develop bone loss in their spine and in their hips is because they're sitting at a desk for eight plus hours a day and they're not countering that with exercise on a regular basis. They're not you know, not building their muscle, they're not building their bone with things like squats or lunges or activities like jumping, uh, rebounding trampoline. Those are also, those are very effective exercises to improve bone density. So if you're sitting for long periods of time, this could be part of the why. So if we, let's make some more room on the board here. If we, if we answer some of the big why parts, why does a person develop bone loss? Number one, lack of activity. Number two, lack of nutrition, and this could be, you know, vitamin and mineral deficiency. So this actually, calcium deficiency can contribute to bone loss, but just because you have bone loss doesn't mean that you have calcium deficiency. You may have heard me say this before, everyone with calcium deficiency has an impact on their bone health, but not everybody with poor bone health has a calcium deficiency. So we can't make the assumption and just load a person up with calcium because that might not be the solution. So lack of nutrition, and that could be calcium, it could be vitamin K, it could be vitamin A, it could be zinc, it could be chromium and copper and manganese and boron and vanadium. All these micronutrients, these minerals and these vitamins that are important in the production of bone health. Another big lifestyle factor, so we're here, we're really just talking about lifestyle factors, lack of sleep. We know that Lack of sleep or sleeping at the wrong time frame actually contributes to osteoporosis and this actually we know this because of shift workers. The studies done on shift workers show that they have a greater propensity toward bone loss. We also know that lack of sunshine can contribute to bone loss. So one of the reasons why, I know many of you are, are, are probably guessing this one, vitamin D. Vitamin D is necessary. We absorb Vitamin D, when the UV light from the sunshine hits our skin, there's a cholesterol in our skin called 7-dehydrocholesterol that's converted into vitamin D. That vitamin D circulates through our body and travels to our intestinal cells and it tells them to absorb calcium more efficiently. And that's one of the ways we actually have the capacity to absorb calcium. Remember, we learned about this the turn of the century with, with rickets. If you ever knew somebody with rickets, they typically have the bowed legs. And uh, so if you ever see somebody walking around with bowed legs, it's because in their childhood they had a vitamin D deficiency that was severe enough that created a weakening of the bone that allowed the bone to bow out, creating that scenario, that bow-legged scenario. So lack of sunshine, very, very important. So if you live in a northern climate or if, you're, if your doctor has told you about your baby, maybe you're a parent, maybe you have a young child and they say, wrap that baby up and don't let it get exposure to any sunshine because we're going to get it skin cancer, you could actually be creating bone loss prematurely in that baby through rickets. So we don't, you know, we obviously want to make sure that we're getting adequate sunshine. Now don't go put your baby on a boat at 12 p.m. and let them get baked, but you know, we certainly need to have an adequate level of sunshine on, on a regular basis. So lack of activity, lack of nutrition, lack of sleep, lack of sunshine. One of the other factors involved in poor bone function is high levels of stress. And I don't mean normal day-to-day -day stress, but I mean super high levels of stress. Stress causes a release of catabolic hormones, steroids. If you've ever heard of corticosteroids, many of you may be in chronic pain taking an oral steroid or had had joint pain at some point in your life and the doctor injected a steroid into a joint. Steroids um, are produced by your adrenal glands above your kidney under intense chronic stress. So the more stress that you're under, great stress, the more you make your own steroid, which again, it's catabolic to bone. Those steroids are catabolic to bone. They, they basically tell the body to break the bone down and to break the muscle down. So this part of you haven't read No Grain, No Pain, those of you who again, who are new to the show, No Grain, No Pain, if you don't have a copy, this, is, this should be your Bible to the show. In essence, you'll pick up more from the show and you'll take more away out of the show if you have that baseline knowledge. 
But again, I talk about something called the gluten muscle wasting cycle, and part of that is because gluten causes chronic increased inflammatory stress, leading to an elevated output of, of our own steroid, which causes fundamental breakdown of our muscle and a fundamental breakdown of our bone. So our body basically catabolically starts to waste and we start to waste away and when we lose our muscle our metabolism slows down and it's easier to gain weight and we hurt more and our muscles get tighter and then we don't want to exercise because when we try to exercise we get in pain it's just this vicious cycle that progressively goes on and on and on and on so these are some of the big kind of lifestyle factors if we're if we're kind of trying to categorize it these are lifestyle choices if you will and it's important that you understand when I say choice I mean you have a choice not you don't have a choice meaning that, that the why comes from the lifestyle choice, which enables you to make changes, enables you to empower yourself to make changes. Otherwise, a number of doctors will tell you that osteoporosis is genetic and that you just need to get used to it and that you don't really have a choice outside of diet and exercise. And even the advice that they'll give you on diet and exercise is so generic and, and, and really not all that helpful because they're not telling you what kind of diet. They're not telling you what kind of exercise to do because certain kinds of exercise will build bone and some kinds of exercise will not build bone. So we got to be specific in that advice and in that recommendation. Now there are a couple of other lifestyle things that will lead to bone destruction. So uh, really one big category and I don't know if my screen if my screen is showing up or if we're getting too low so I'm going to pull this up here. Number six it's medication. Now, there's several classes of medications that can actually disrupt bone formation and, and the big category that we see really in high levels in a lot of people is anti-acids or antacids. Um, things like Tums and Rolaids and Prilosec and Nexium and Tagamet, um, those are drugs that block in some way, block either block the stomach acid by neutralizing it or block your body's ability to produce the stomach acid itself. And why is this important? because we need that stomach acid to absorb magnesium and calcium and zinc and copper. We also need it to absorb B12. Vitamin B12 is it's critical. In one of the functions of vitamin B12, we could add this to the list of lab tests. There's no way I could cover everything today, but um, B12 deficiency will elevate homocysteine, which is a biochemical byproduct that actually can cause bone damage and can actually break your bone down. So these nutrients to be absorbed properly from the food that you eat require stomach acid. So if you're chronically taking antacid medications or if you're taking acid blocking medications, and many of you may be, you're actually contributing to an onset of nutritionally induced bone loss as a result of the medication, what we would call drug induced nutritional deficit based bone loss. So this is one of the top meds that we'll see creating bone loss. Now another one that we'll see creating bone loss, and I mentioned this a moment ago, is the steroids. Steroids have a catabolic effect. Catabolic means breaking down. So they basically they break down tissue and when you're breaking down bone tissue as a result of long-term steroid use, and this where would we see somebody with long-term steroid use? This would be an individual who potentially is and chronic pain and so they're on a prednisone or a corticosteroid or they've been injected because um, because they have a joint issue or they're taking the drug orally those are the kind of the most common things and it's not the single use so it's not like uh, you had such severe inflammation that a doctor put you on a steroid for a day or two it's the chronic use it's the using them every day consistently over time who do we typically see using chronic steroids people with chronic pain conditions Potentially, I mean, for the most part, autoimmunity. So rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, scleroderma, dermatomyositis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. So if you have any of those conditions, you, you may look at the medicines that you're on and you're probably going to find that, that one in that list is potentially a steroid. And I want you to understand that long-term use of steroids, even at low doses, creates bone health issues, creates bone loss. Because why? Not only do these drugs have a catabolic effect, but they actually... Uh, they reduce your body's capacity to utilize calcium and vitamin D and magnesium. So very, very important that you understand that. And now some people will say, well, what if I'm on a steroid and I take extra calcium, vitamin D, and magnesium? 
Yes, but it doesn't fully override the effect of the medication. Same thing here. You can take more, but again, if you, if you don't have acid, you can't absorb. So you've got to keep that in mind. And, and again, why is the bigger question? And, and that goes even back to these. If you're on these medications, you still, why is still, is still what you want to ask. Why do I need these medications for the rest of my life? What other medications do we know that can cause bone loss? Another big one, we're getting kind of messy up here, is drugs for, let me not write out hypertension, let me instead write out blood pressure drugs, right? These are the medications um, like diuretics, like hydrochlorothiazide is a perfect example, Diavan, HCT is a, is a common one that's used. There's also um, a number of other diuretics, Lasix is a very common one that's used, furosemide is another one. But these medications, these blood pressure medications, actually, because of their diuretic action, will cause magnesium and calcium loss, but also potassium loss. as it's abbreviated as a K, potassium loss. So blood pressure medications directly can create a deficiency of calcium, magnesium, and potassium. All three of those are required for bone health. Interestingly enough, all three of those are also required to regulate blood pressure. So the longer you're on a diuretic, um, the more you create an imbalance in your electrolytes that forces you to stay on that diuretic. And then generally what happens is another, another medication gets added to that mix because the diuretic at, at a certain point in time will start to fail. So these classes of medications, again, antacids, steroids, blood pressure medication, super duper common for, for those people who, um, who develop bone loss. Now there's one other class of medication. Do I have room to put it? Um, let's see here. I think we got room right here. Let's put it in blood thinners. And this particularly um, are the vitamin K antagonists. It's funny, I, I, it, I always found that it was ironic that when a, when a person comes to see me, the doctor put them on Coumadin or Warfarin to keep their blood thin because of the past history of a heart attack or a stroke, and they want to keep their blood really thin, and so this person's got, you know, big splotchy bruises all over their body because their blood's way too thin because they're taking these anticoagulant blood thinners which, by the way, block vitamin K, and what their doctor says is, by the way, don't eat green leafies at all because that will interfere with your medication and we need to keep your blood thin. But the green leafies are richest in potassium and they're richest in magnesium and they're richest in calcium. So the very nature of the reason that people oftentimes develop cardiovascular disease is because of electrolyte deficiency because they don't eat enough vegetables and then they end up at a point where their blood's so thick that they have a heart attack and then the doctor says, here's the blood thinner and by the way, don't eat any more greens. It doesn't. It makes absolutely zero sense. So I hope that's not who you are. I hope that if you're listening to the show today, that that's not you. And if it is, I would strongly encourage you to go have a conversation about this scenario with the prescribing doctor and, and see what future holds for being able to potentially get off of those things. Because there are lots of things that can naturally keep your blood thin without blocking vitamin K. Why do I mention this in terms of bone health? Because Vitamin K is critical to the formation of the proteins that make up the backbone of your collagen matrix of your bone. So in order to form strong, resilient, pliable bone, you absolutely need vitamin K and these bone blood or these blood thinning medications inhibit vitamin K. So very, very important that you understand that. And um, you know, again, if you're struggling with a prior diagnosis of osteopenia, osteoporosis, and these are any of the scenarios that you've had put in front of you, you should understand that there, that is going to require a deeper conversation, and you really want to get used to asking this question why. If you ask it enough, you might actually get your doctor to crack a textbook or read a, a, a new research study in nutrition in the field of nutrition as opposed to just dismissing you. However, many of you will probably say it's a waste of time to ask the doctor because they don't listen anyway. I still like to encourage that communication. I still want you, if you've got a doctor managing any kind of medications or health condition, to still have, look, the power to empower yourself to stand up and have this conversation. It's very, very important. It's got to start somewhere. And so if we all did that, if everybody took their health as serious to ask that question why and think about these kinds of things, Think about how many doctors would be forced to start learning this information just to keep up with the tide, right? Just to keep up with the demand of people wanting to know what else could be done as opposed to just being dismissed from the office 
and have, you know, having a doctor look at you like you've got 20 horns coming out of your head because this is weird and this is hard, right? This is harder than just take this drug. And so you've got to know these things and you've got to apply these things. You can't just know these things and not apply them. You have to know them and then you have to apply them. Hey, and if you missed the earlier part of this series, click right here so you can go back and get caught up. The information there might be critical to helping you on your path to better health. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe for updates below. Have a great day.